May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It is good to be back home here at St. Bartholomew's to serve as an assisting priest. This place for me has been a sanctuary of healing. You see, back in 2004, 16 years ago, I was a little lost. I had just come out as a gay man, and in the divorce that followed, I lost the church that I went to, St. Patrick's in Dunwoody. And while I was suddenly free to live as God had created me to be, I still had to deal with a great deal of pain that I had caused, as well as find a place to live, begin a new life, and find a new church. And this healing process would take a number of years. So after a bit of wandering in the wilderness of churches, I came here to this place of peace, of worship, of ministry, this beautiful property, this lovely building. Though I was lost, I was found at the invitation of Nan Ross and Eleanor Pritchett, who were colleagues of mine at the Day One Ministry and the Episcopal Media Center. And I immediately felt at home here. And during the years that followed, I was nourished here, as St. Paul put it in his letter to the Corinthians, by the solid food of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then later, back in 2011, after several years of healing and growing here, St. Bart's became my sending parish as I embarked on the discernment process toward priesthood. And so this will always be a special place for me as my sending parish as a priest. And then in June 2014, I was ordained a priest, and in August of that year, I married my beloved Dan Lay in Maine, and in November of that year, our marriage was blessed right over there in the chapel in a lovely ceremony with friends, and that moment will bless me forever. So after several years of serving in other parishes, it's wonderful to be back here at my home parish of St. Bart's to assist our rector, Angela. I'm so grateful for the opportunity to serve here with her and with you. I was lost, but I've been found. So that's a little bit about me, and here's some more secret background information. I confess that I was a big comic book geek when I was a kid, and Marvel Comics were my favorite. The Incredible Hulk, Mighty Thor, the Fantastic Four, the Uncanny X-Men. Have you heard of those? Well, these and other characters were created by Stan Lee and Jack Kirby. Stan the Man Lee, the Marvel editor and writer, passed away in his 90s in November of 2018. He was a hero of mine, and I think one of the reasons that I wanted to become a writer was because he was a writer. And in my adulthood, I was so blessed to be able to spend a half hour with him in his office in Hollywood just to talk about comics. Now, Jack Kirby has been called the king of comics, powerful artist, imaginative creator, one of my favorite comic book artists. I still have a close group of email buddies. All of us grew up together during that time reading these comic books, and we all love Stan and Jack. But, to be totally honest, there is a great ongoing controversy about who really created what in the Marvel Universe. In the late 1960s, Jack Kirby got fed up with Stan getting all the credit, despite the fact that he plotted and drew the stories. He left Marvel to go to the competition, DC Comics. It was horrifying. 
Well, today the controversy is only growing among comic book geeks about who should get the real credit. I belong to Stan Lee. One friend of mine in particular belongs to Jack Kirby. The sides are clear and huge debates rage online in email lists, on Facebook groups, and in person at comic book conventions. Yes, they have those. Well, I thought of that huge controversy when I read 1 Corinthians 3. Humor me. Here, Paul addresses the divisions of the church in Corinth, an important and wealthy city on the isthmus separating northern and southern Greece. Paul spent 18 months there during his second missionary journey, establishing the church there. He moved on to other ports, and now he's writing this letter in response to a report about problems there in the Corinthian church. And in this letter, he provides guidance for how to deal with those problems. The primary problem was division in the church. And Paul first talks about this in chapter 1, but as he is wont to do, he gets sidetracked going on about Christ as the true wisdom of God. It's good stuff, but maybe he's avoiding the conflict. I don't know. But eventually he does get back to the battle. And Paul begins by calling the Corinthians babies in Christ. He claims they aren't spiritually wise because they're having these fights. He is telling them not only to grow up spiritually, but he also undercuts their own self assessment as mature, wise, spiritual super-Christians. Paul was great at PR, wasn't he? He asks, for when one says, I belong to Paul, and another, I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Stan Lee, and I belong to Jack Kirby, are you not merely human? Now, I get it. We've all seen and been part of congregations that get divided and distracted by personalities, by allegiances to certain leaders, former ways of doing things, old habits, old fights. There's nothing new about that anywhere, as we can see here. But I think the church today, broadly, too often falls into this Corinthian trap. Many Christians adopt the culture's claims about what ought to be valued and pursued as the center of our identity. Things like nationalism, power and privilege, prosperity, and some safe distance between us and those who would make that prosperity uncomfortable. Some Christians today, like the Corinthians, resist being shaped by the wisdom of the cross. Who then is Apollos? Who is Paul? They are merely servants through whom these people came to believe in God. Paul says he planted the seeds, Apollos watered them. But God is the one who gave the growth. So there are interesting verb tenses there. Paul and Apollos' actions are clearly past tense. These things happen. They've been done. But the verb used for God is giving the growth is present tense, stressing God's ongoing, continual action. The labor of Paul and of Apollos would have been fruitless if God had not been working all along. So Paul says different leaders in the Corinthian church should not be seen as rallying points for competing parties, but as co-workers performing complementary tasks for the achievement of a common goal. And this, beloved siblings, is the goal for every church. The Corinthians, Paul says, were arguing about the wrong things. The individual leaders, Paul and Apollos, weren't the issue as they thought. No, God is what matters. So Paul's words might lead us to imagine what it means, what it can mean, that our calling as believers at St. Bartholomew's, just as at Corinth, is to plant the seeds of God's mercy, which will grow by God's action 
and in God's time. The church and its leaders all belong to God. And the church has its identity from that reality. Both Apollos and Paul should be seen to have been working together under God to build the church in Corinth. Paul had addressed the Corinthians up front as the church of God in chapter 1, verse 2, but they had failed to realize the implications of that charge. The church, the Corinthian church, St. Bartholomew's church, the whole church belongs to God. We are called, each one of us, to nurture and water God's mercy with compassion and love and justice and leave whatever growth in whatever form, up to God. Paul uses two metaphors in verse 9 to help the Corinthians imagine these complementary ministries. For we, Apollos and I, are God's servants, literally God's fellow workers, working together. You are God's field, God's building. First, the agricultural metaphor. Paul scattered the seed, Apollos watered and cared for it. The church is the field itself, and any growth comes only from God, which means God is the one, the only one, in whom that whole interchange, who is worthy of allegiance. The church is the field, the property in which the leaders are working, and the church is the building they are helping to construct. The Corinthians are dependent on the workers, yes, but ultimately dependent on God. Dear siblings, you and I, here at St. Bart's, we are God's field, God's building. I think of this piece of property, this, this field here, beautifully wooded, holding so many wonderful memories for me and for you a place for the community of believers, but also for the community at large, a field for ministry in so many ways, a field for service, for music and worship, for learning and growing together, a field of dreams. And I think of this building, which for me has always been a place of safety and peace, a sanctuary where we sing and pray and eat and get challenged by the word of God. I think of all the people here and of those who have gone before us, those who are so dedicated and involved in making this field and this building look good and feel welcoming and operating as well as it can. Dear siblings, God is growing new things in our field. God is building us stronger as a parish. We are God's field, God's building, because we belong to God. Not to Paul, not to Apollos, not to Stan Lee or Jack Kirby. We belong to God. Thanks be to God. Amen.